Texas John Alden by Robert Howard I hear the citizens of Warhoop has organized themselves into a committee of public safety, which they says is to protect the town again me, Breckenridge Elkins. Such doings as that irritates me. You'd think I was a public menace or something. I'm pretty darn tired of their slanders. I didn't tear down their cussed jail. The buffalo hunters done it. How could I when I was in it at the time? As for the Silver Boots Saloon and Dance Hall, it wouldn't have got shot up if the owner had showed any sense. It was Ace Middleton's own fault he got his hind leg busted in three places, and if the city marshal had been tending to his own business instead of persecuting a poor, helpless stranger, he wouldn't have got the seat of his breeches full of buckshot. Folks which says I went to Warhoop a purpose to wreck the town is liars. I never had no idea at first of going there at all. It's off the railroad and infested with tin-horn gamblers and buffalo hunters and such like varmints, and no place for a trail driver. My visit to this lair of vice came about like this. I'd rode point on a herd of longhorns clean from the lower Pecos to Goshen, where the railroad was, and I stayed there after the trail boss and the other boys headed south to spark the bell of the town, Betty Wilkinson, which gal was as purty as a brand new buoy knife. She seemed to like me middlin' tolerable, but I had rivals, notably a snub-nosed Arizona waddy by the name of Biz Ridgeway. This varmint's persistence was so plumb aggravatin' that I come in on him sudden-like one mornin' in the back room of the Spanish Mustang in Goshen, and I says, Listen here, you sand burr in the pants of progress. I'm a peaceable man, generous and retiring to a fault, but I'm reaching the limit of my endurance. Ain't they no gals in Arizona that you got to come pesterin' mine? Why don't you go on back home where you belong, anyhow? I'm asking you like a gent to keep away from Betty Wilkinson before something unpleasant is forced to happen to you. He kind of reared up and says, I ain't the only gent which is sparkin', Betty. Why don't you make war talk with Rudwell Shapley, Jr.? He ain't nothing but a puddin-headed tenderfoot, I responded coldly. I don't consider him in no serious light. A gal with as much sense as Betty wouldn't pay him no mind. But you got a slick tongue and might snake your way ahead of me. So I'm telling you, he started to get up in a hurry, and I reached for my buoy. But then he sunk back down in his chair, and to my amazement, he busted into tears. What in thunder's the matter with you? I demanded, shocked. Woe is me, moaned he. You're right, Breck. I got no business hanging around Betty but I didn't know she was your gal. I ain't got no matrimonial intention on to her. I'm just kind of consoling myself with her company whilst being parted by cruel fate from my own true love. Hey, I says, pricking up my ears and uncocking my pistol. You ain't in love with Betty. You got another gal? A pitcher of divine beauty vowed he, wiping his eyes on my bandana. Gloria Lavener, which swings in the silver boot over to Warhoop. We was to wed. Here his emotions overcome him, and he sobbed loudly. But fate interfered, he moaned. I was banished from Warhoop, never to return. In a thoughtless moment, I kind of pushed a bartender with a claw hammer, and he had a stroke of apoplexy or something, and died, and they blamed me. I was forced to flee without telling my true love where I was going. I ain't dared to go back because them folks over there is so 
prejudiced agin me, they threatens to arrest me on sight. My true love is eatin' her heart out, waitin' for me to come and claim her as my bride, whilst I lives here in exile. Biz then wept bitterly on my shoulder, till I throwed him off in some embarrassment. Why don't you write her a letter, you dad blame fool, I asked. I can't write nor read neither, he said, and I don't trust nobody to send word to her by. She's so beautiful, the critter I'd send would probably fall in love with her herself, the low-down polecat. Suddenly he grabbed my hand with both of his and, and said, Breck, you got an honest face, and I never did believe all they say about you anyway. Why don't you go and tell her? I'll do better than that if it'll keep you away from Betty, I says. I'll bring this gal over here to Goshen. You're a gent, says he, wringing my hand. I wouldn't entrust nobody else with such a sacred mission. Just go to the Silver Boot and tell Ace Middleton you want to see Gloria Leviner alone. All right, I said. I'll rent a buckboard to bring her back in. I'll be counting the hours till you heaves over the horizon with my true love, declaimed he, reaching for the whiskey bottle. So I hustled out, and who should I run into but that poor sapified shrimp of a Rudwell Shapely Jr. in his monkey jacket and tight riding pants and varnished English boots. We liked to have a collision as I barged through the swinging doors, and he squeaked and staggered back and hollered, Don't shoot! Who said anything about shooting? I asked irritably, and he kind of got his color back and looked me over like I was a sideshow or something, like he always done. Your home, says he, is a long way from here, is it not, Mr. Elkins? Yeah, I said, I live on Wolf Mountain, way down near where the Pecos runs into the Rio Grande. Indeed, he said, kind of hopefully. I suppose you'll be returning soon? Nah, I ain't, I says. I'll probably stay here all fall. Oh, says he dejectedly and went off looking like someone had kicked him in the pants. I wondered why he should get so down in the mouth just because I weren't going home. But them tenderfoots ain't got no sense, and they ain't no use wasting time trying to figure out why they does things, because they generally don't know theirselves. For instance, why should an object like Rudwell Shapely Jr. come to Goshen, I wanted to know. I asked him once, point blank, and he says it was a primitive urge to see life in the raw, whatever that means. I thought maybe he was talking about grub, but the cook at the Laramie restaurant says he takes his beefsteaks well done like the rest of us. Well, anyway, I got onto my hoss, Captain Kidd, and pulled for Warhoop, which laid some miles west of Goshen. I weren't wasting no time, because the quicker I got... Gloria Lavenner to Goshen, the quicker I'd have a clear field with Betty. Of course, it would have been easier and quicker just to shoot Biz, but I didn't know how Betty'd take it. Women is funny that way. I figured to eat dinner at the halfway house, a tavern which stood on the prairie about halfway between Goshen and Warhoop, but as I approached it I met a most peculiar-looking object heading east. I presently recognized it as a cowboy named Tump Garrison, and he looked like he'd been through a sorghum mill. His hat brim was pulled loose from the crown and hung around his neck like a collar. His clothes hung in rags. His face was skint all over, and one ear showed signs of having been chawed on long and earnestly. Where was the tornado, I asked, pulling up. He gave me a suspicious look out of the eye he could still see with. Oh, it's you, Breck, he says then. My brains is so addled I didn't recognize you at first. In fact, says he, tenderly caressing a lump on his head the size of a turkey egg, 
It's just a few minutes ago I managed to remember my own name. What happened? I asked with interest. I ain't sure, says he, spitting out two or three loose tushes. Leastwise, I ain't sure just what happened after that there table leg was shattered over my head. Things is a little foggy after that, but up to that time my memory is flawless. Briefly, Breck, says he, rising in his stirrups to rub his pants where they was the print of a boot heel. I discovered that I warn't welcome at the halfway house, and big as you be, I advises you to avoid it like you would the yaller jandice. It's a public tavern, I says. It was, says he, working his right leg to see if it was still in giant. It was till Moose Harrison, the buffalo hunter, arrived there to hold a private celebration of his own. He don't like cattle, nor them which handles them. He told me so himself just before he hit me with the bung starter. He said he weren't aiming to be pestered by no darn Texas cattle pushers whilst he's enjoying a little relaxation. It was just after issuing this statement that he throwed me through the roulette wheel. You ain't from Texas, I said. You're from the nations. That's what I told him whilst he was doing a war dance on my brisket, says Tump. But he said he was too broad-minded to bother with technicalities. Anyway, he says cowboys was the plague of the range, irregardless of where they come from. Oh, he did, did he? I says irritably. Well, I ain't hunting trouble. I'm on an errand of mercy. But he better not shoot off his big mouth to me. I eats my dinner at the halfway house regardless of all the buffalo hunters north of the Cimarron. I'd give a dollar to see the fun, says Tump, but my other eyes closing fast, and I got to get amongst friends. So he pulled for Goshen, and I rode on to the halfway house, where I seen a big bay hoss tied to the hitch rack. I watered Captain Kidd and went in. Sss, the bartender says, Get out quick as you can. Moose Harrison's asleep in the back room. I'm hungry, I responded, setting down at a table which stood nigh the bar. Bring me a steak with potatoes and onions and a quart of coffee and a can of clean peaches. And whilst the stuff's cooking, give me nine or ten bottles of beer to wash the dust out of my gullet. Listen, says the barkeep. Reflect and consider. You're young and life is sweet. Don't you know that Moose Harrison is pison to anything that looks like a cowpuncher? When he's on a whiskey tear as at present, he's more painter than human. He's killed more men. Will you stop blatting and bring me my rations? I requested. He shakes his head sad-like and says, Well, all right. After all, it's your hide. At least try not to make no racket. He swore to have the lifeblood of anybody which wakes him up. I said I didn't want no trouble with nobody, and he tiptoed back to the kitchen and whispered my order to the cook, then brung me nine or ten bottles of beer and slipped back behind the bar and watched me with morbid fascination. I drunk the beer, and whilst drinking I got to kind of brooding about Moose Harrison having the nerve to order everybody to keep quiet whilst he slept. But they're liars which claims I throwed the empty bottles at the door in the back room, a purpose to wake Harrison up. When the waiter brung my grub, I wanted to clear the table to make room for it, so I just kind of tossed the bottles aside, and could I help it if they all busted on the back room door? Was it my fault that Harrison was such a light sleeper? But the bartender moaned and ducked down behind the bar, and the waiter run through the kitchen and followed the cook in a sprint across the prairie. 
and a most remarkable beller burst forth from the back room. The next instant the door was tore off the hinges, and an enormous human came bulging into the bar room. He wore buckskins, his whiskers bristled, and his eyes was red as a drunk Comanche's. What in tarnation, remarked he in a voice which cracked the window panes. Does my gall-blasted eyes deceive me? Is that there a cussed cow-puncher sitting there wolfing beefsteak as brash as if he was a white man? You ride herd on them insults, I roared, rising sudden, and his eyes kind of popped when he seen I was about three inches taller than him. I got as much right here as you have. Name your weapons, blustered he. He had a butcher knife and two six-shooters on his belt. Name em yourself, I snorted. If you think you're such a hell whizzer at fist and skull, why shuck your weapon belt and I'll claw your ears off with my bare hands. That suits me, says he. I'll festoon that bar with your innards and he takes hold of his belt like he was going to unbuckle it. Then, quick as a flash, he whipped out a gun. But I was watching for that, and my right hand forty-five banged just as his muzzle cleared leather. The barkeep stuck his head up from behind the bar. Heck, he says, wild-eyed, you beat Moose Harrison to the draw, and him with the edge. I wouldn't have believed it was possible if I hadn't saw it. But his friends'll ride your trail for this. Warn't it self-defense, I demanded. A clear case, says he. But that won't mean nothing to them wild and woolly buffalo skinners. You better get back to Goshen where you got friends. I got business in Warhoop, I says. Dang it, my coffee's cold. Dispose of the carcass and heat it up, will you? So he drug Harrison out, cussin' cause he was so heavy, claimin' I ought to help him. But I told him it weren't my tavern. I also refused to pay for a decanter which Harrison's wild shot had busted. He got mad and said he hoped the buffalo hunters did hang me. But I told him they'd have to catch me without my guns first, and I slept with them on. Then I finished my dinner and pulled for Warhoop. It was about sundown when I got there, and I was pretty hungry again. But I aimed to see Biz's gal before I'd done anything else. So I put my hoss in the livery stable and seen he had a big feed. Then I headed for the silver boot, which is the biggest joint in town. There was plenty hilarity going on, but I seen no cowboys. The revelers was mostly gamblers, or buffalo hunters, or soldiers, or freighters. Warhoop weren't popular with cattlemen. They weren't no buyers or loading pins there, and for pleasure it weren't nigh as good a town as Goshen anyway. I asked a barman where Ace Middleton was, and he pointed out a big feller with a generous tummy, decorated with a fancy vest and a gold watch chain about the size of a trace chain. He wore mighty handsome clothes and a diamond hoss shoe stick pin and waxed mustache. So I went up to him. He looked me over with very little favor. Oh, a cowpuncher, eh? Well, your money's as good as anybody's. Enjoy yourself, but don't get wild. I ain't aiming to get wild, I says. I want to see Gloria Levener. When I says that, he give a convulsive start and choked on a cigar. Everybody nigh us stopped laughing and talking and turned to watch us. What did you say? he gurgled, gagging up the cigar. Did I honestly hear you asking to see Gloria Lavanner? Sure, I says. I aim to take her back to Goshen to get married. You deleted expletive says he, and grabbed up a table and broke off a leg and hit me over the head with it. It was most unexpected and took me plumb off guard. I hadn't no idea what he was busting the table up for, and I was too surprised to duck. If it hadn't been for my Stetson, it might have cracked my head. As it was, it knocked me back into the crowd, but before I could get my balance, 
three or four bouncers grabbed me and somebody jerked my pistol out of the scabbard. Throw him out, roared Ace, acting like a wild man. He was plumb purple in the face. Steal my girl, will he? Hold him while I bust him in the snoot. He then rushed up and hit me very severely in the nose, whilst them bouncers was holding my arms. Well, up to that time I hadn't made no resistance. I was too astonished. But this was going too far, even if Ace was loco, as it appeared. Nobody weren't holding my legs, so I kicked Ace in the stomach, and he curled up on the floor with a strangled shriek. I then started spurring them bouncers in the legs, and they yelled and let go of me, and somebody hit me in the ear with a blackjack. That made me mad, so I retched for my buoy in my boot, but a big red-headed maverick kicked me in the face when I stooped down. That straightened me up, so I hit him on the jaw, and he fell down across Ace, which was holding his stomach and trying to yell for the city marshal. Some low-minded scoundrel got a strangle hold around my neck from behind and started beating me on the head with a pair of brass knucks. I ducked and throwed him over my head, then I kicked out backwards and knocked over a couple more. But a scar-faced thug with a baseball bat got in a full-armed lick about that time, and I went to my knees feeling like my skull was dislocated. Six or seven of them then throwed themselves onto me with howls of joy, and I seen I'd have to use violence in spite of myself. So I drawed my buoy and started cutting my way through them. They couldn't let go of me quicker if I'd been a cougar. They scattered every which away, splattering blood and howling blue murder, and I riz raring and rampacious. Somebody shot at me just then, and I wheeled to locate him when a man run in at the door and pointed a pistol at me. Before I could sling my knife through him, which was my earnest intention, he hollered, Drop your deadly weapon. I'm the city marshal and you're under arrest. What for, I demanded. I ain't done nothing. Nothing, says Apes Middleton fiercely, as his menials lifted him onto his feet. You've just sliced pieces out of five or six of our leading citizens, and here's my head bouncer, Red Krogan, out cold with a busted jaw, to say nothing of pushing my stomach through my spine. Ow! Oh, you must have mule blood in you, blast your soul. Sentry, he ordered the marshal. He came in here drunk and raging and threatening, and started a fight for nothing. Do your duty. Arrest that cussed outlaw. Well, Pap always tells me not to never resist no officer of the law. And anyway, the marshal had my gun. And so many people was hollering and cussing and talking, it kind of confused me. When they's any thinking to be did, I like to have a quiet place to do it in plenty of time. So the first thing I knowed, Santry had handcuffs on me, and he hauls me off down the street with a big crowd follering, making remarks which is supposed to be funny. They come to a log hut with bars on the back window, take off the handcuffs, shove me in, and lock the door. There I was in jail without even seeing Gloria Levener. It was plumb disgustful. The crowd all hustled back to the silver boot to watch them fellers get sewed up which had fell a foul of my buoy, all but one fat cuss which said he was a guard, and he sopped down in the front of the jail with a double-barreled shotgun across his lap and went to sleep. Well, there weren't nothing in the jail but a bunk with a hoss blanket on it and a wooden bench. The bunk was too short for me to sleep on with any comfort, being built for a six-foot man, so I sopped down on it and waited for someone to bring me some grub. So after a while the marshal come and looked in at the window and cussed me. It's a good thing for you, he says, that you didn't kill none of them fellers. As it is, maybe we won't hang you. You won't have to hang me if you don't bring me some grub pretty soon, I says. Are you gonna let me starve in this darn jail? We don't encourage crime in our town by feeding criminals, he says. If you want grub, give me the money to buy it with. I told him I didn't have but five bucks, and I thought I'd pay him a fine with that. 
He said five bucks wouldn't begin to pay my fine, so I give him the five spot to buy grub with, and he took it and went off. I waited and waited, but he didn't come. I hollered to the guard, but he kept on snoring. Then pretty soon someone said, Psst! at the window. I went over and looked out, and they was a woman standing behind the jail. The moon had come up over the prairie as bright as day, and though she had a cloak with a hood thrown over her, by what I could see of her face she was awful purty. I'm Gloria Leventer, says she. I'm risking my life coming here. But I wanted to get a look at the man who was crazy enough to tell Ace Middleton he wanted to see me. What's crazy about that? I asked. Don't you know Ace has killed three men already for trying to flirt with me? says she. Any man who can break Red Krogan's jaw like you did must be a bear cat. But it was sheer madness to tell Ace you wanted to marry me. Ah, oh, he never give me time to explain about that, I says. It weren't me which wants to marry you. But what business is it of Middleton's? This here's a free country. That's what I thought till I started working for him, she says bitterly. He fell in love with me and he's so insanely jealous he won't let anyone even speak to me. He keeps me practically a prisoner and watches me like a hawk. I can't get away from him. Nobody in town dares to help me. They won't even rent me a horse at the livery stable. You see, Ace owns most of the town, and lots of people are in debt to him. The rest are afraid of him. I guess I'll have to spend the rest of my life under his thumb she says despairfully. You won't neither, I says. As soon as I can get word to my friends in Goshen to send me a loan to pay my fine and get me out of this fool jail, I'll take you to Goshen where your true love is pining for you. My true love, says she, kind of startled like. What do you mean? Diz Ridgeway is in Goshen, I says. He don't dare come after you hisself so he sent me to fetch you. She didn't say nothing for a spell, and then she spoke kind of breathless. All right, I must get back to the silver boot now, or Ace will miss me and start looking for me. I'll find Santry and pay your fine tonight. When he lets you out, come to the back door of the silver boot and wait in the alley. I'll come to you there as soon as I can slip away. So I said all right, and she went away. The guard sitting in front of the jail with his shotgun across his knees hadn't never woke up. But he did wake up about fifteen minutes after she left. A gang of men came up the street, whooping and cussing, and he jumped to his feet. Curses! Here comes Brant Hanson and the mob of them buffler hunters, and they got a rope! They're heading for the jail! Who do you reckon they're after? I inquired. They ain't nobody in jail but you, he suggested pointedly. And in about a minute, they ain't going to be nobody nigh it but you and them. When Hanson and his bunch is in liquor, they don't care who they shoots. He then laid down a shotgun and lit a shuck down a back alley as hard as he could leg it. So about a dozen buffalo hunters in buckskins and whiskers come surging up to the jail and kicked on the door. They couldn't get the door open, so they went around behind the shack and looked in at the window. It's him, all right, says one of them. Let's shoot him through the window. But the other said, Nah, let's do the job in proper order. And I asked them what they wanted. We aims to hang you, they answered enthusiastically. You can't do that, I says. It's again the law. You killed Moose Harrison, said the biggest one, which they called Hanson. Well, it was an even break, and he tried to get the drop on me, I says. Then Hanson says, Enough of such quibbling. We've made up our mind to hang you, so let's don't hear no more arguments about it. Here, he says to his pals, tie a rope to the bars and we'll jerk the whole winder out. It'll be easier than busting down the door. And hustle up, because I'm in a hurry to get back to that poker game at the Raring Buffalo. So they tied a rope onto the bars and all laid onto it and heaved and grunted. Some of the bars come loose at one end. I picked up the bench aiming to bust their fool skulls with it as they clung through the window. 
But just then another fellow run up. Wait, boys, he hollered. Don't waste your muscle. I just seen Santry down at the Topeka Queen gambling with the money he'd taken off that dern cowboy, and he give me the key to the door. So they abandoned the winder and surged round to the front of the jail, and I quickly propped the bench again the door, and run to the winder and tore out them bars which is already loose. I could hear em rattling at the door, and as I clumb through the winder, one of em said, The lock's turned, but the door's stuck. Heave again it. So whilst they have, I run around the jail and pick up the guard's shotgun where he dropped it when he run off. Just then the bench give way inside and the door flew open, and all them fellers tried to crowd through. As a result, they was all jammed up in the door and cussing something fierce. Quit crowding, yelled Hanson. Holy catamount, he's gone. The jail's empty. I then up with my shotgun and give em both barrels in the seat of their breeches, which was the handiest to aim at, and they let out a most amazing squall and busted loose and fell head first into the jail. Some of em kept on going head down like they'd started and hit the back wall so hard it knocked em stiff, and the others fell over em. They was all tangled up in a pile, cussin and yellin to beat the devil. So I slammed the door and locked it and run around behind the jailhouse. Hanson was trying to climb out the window, so I hit him over the head with my shotgun and he fell back inside and hollered, Help! I'm mortally injured! Shut up that unseemly clamor, I said sternly. Ain't none of you hurt bad. Throw your guns out the window and lay down on the floor. Hustle before I gives you another blast through the window. They didn't know the shotgun was empty. So they throwed their weapons out in a hurry and laid down, but they weren't quiet about it. They seemed to consider they'd been subjected to cruel and unusual treatment, and the bird shot in their sterns must have been a stingin' right smart, because the language they used was plumb painful to hear. I stuck a couple of their pistols in my belt. If one of you shows your head at that winder within an hour, I says, he'll get it blowed off. I then snuck back into the shatters and headed for the livery stable. The livery stable man was reading a newspaper by a lantern, and he looked surprised and said he thought I was in jail. I ignored this remark and told him to hitch me a fast hoss to a buckboard whilst I saddled Captain Kidd. Wait a minute, says he. I hear tell you told Ace Middleton you ain't to elope with Gloria Levener. You taken this rig for her? Yes, I am, I says. Well, I'm a friend of Middleton's, he says, and I won't rent you no rig under no circumstances. Then get out of my way, I said. I'll hitch the hoss up myself. He then drawed a buoy, so I clinched with him, and as we was wrestling around, he sort of knocked his head against the swingle tree I happened to have in my hand at the time, and collapses with a low gurgle. So I tied him up and rolled him under an oats bin. I also rolled out a buckboard and hitched the best-looking harness hoss I could find to it, and them folks's liars, which is going around saying I stole that there outfit. It was sent back later. I saddled my hoss and tied him on behind the buckboard and got in and started for the silver boot, wondering how long it'd take them fool buffalo hunters to find out I was just bluffing, and weren't lying out behind the jail to shoot em as they climbed out. I turned into the alley which run behind the silver boot, then tied the hosses and went up to the back door and peeked in. Gloria was there. She grabbed me and I could feel her trembling. I thought you'd never come, she whispered. It'll be time for my singing act again in just a few minutes. I've been waiting here ever since I paid Santry your fine. What kept you so long? He left the silver boot as soon as I gave him money. He never turned me out, the low-down skunk. I muttered. Some, uh, friends got me out. Come on, get in the buckboard. I helped her up and give her the lines. I got a debt to settle before I leave town, I said. You go on and wait for me at that clump of cottonwoods east of town. I'll be on pretty soon. So she pulled out in a hurry, and I got on to Captain Kidd. I rode him around to the front of the silver boot, tied him to the hitch rack, and dismounted. The silver boot was crowded. I could see Ace strutting around, chawing a big black cigar, and joking and slapping folks on the back. 
Everybody was having such a hilarious time, nobody noticed me as I stood in the barway. So I pulled the Buffalo Hunter's forty fives and let bam at the mirror behind the bar. The barman yelped and ducked the flying glass, and everybody whirled and gaped, and Ace jerked his cigar out of his mouth and bawled, It's that turn cowpuncher again. Get him. But them bouncers had seen my guns, and they was shying away, all except the scar-faced thug which had hit me with the bat, and he whipped a gun from under his vest. So I shot him through the right shoulder, and he fell over behind the monte table. I'd begun to spray the crowd with hot lead, free and generous, and they stampeded every which away. Some went through the window, glass and all, and some went out the side doors, and some busted down the back door in their flight. I likewise riddled the mirror behind the bar and shot down some of the hanging lamps and busted most of the bottles on the shelves. Ace ducked behind a stack of beer kegs and opened fire on me, but he showed poor judgment in not noticing he was right under a hanging lamp. I shot it off the ceiling, and it fell down on his head, and you ought to have heard him holler when the burning aisle run down his worthless neck. He come prancing into the open, wiping his neck with one hand and trying to shoot me with the other, and I drilled him through the hind leg. He fell down and bellowed like a bull with its tail cotched in a fence gate. You darn murderer, says he passionately. I'll have your life for this. Shut up, I snarled. I'm just paying you back for all the pain and humiliation I suffered in this den of iniquity. At this moment a bartender riz up from behind a billiard table with a sawed-off shotgun, but I shot it out of his hands before he could cock it and he fell over backwards hollering, Spare my life! Just then somebody yelled, Halt! In the name of the law! And I looked around and saw it was that tin-horn marshal named Santry with a gun in his hand. I arrest you again, he bawled. Lay down your weapons. I'll lay your carcass down, I responded. You ain't fitting for to be no law officer. You gambled away the five dollars I give you for grub, and you took the fine money Miss Lavenner gave you, and didn't turn me out, and you give the key to them mobsters which wanted to hang me. You ain't no law. You're a dern outlaw yourself. Now you got a gun in your hand same as me. Either start shooting or throw it down. Well, he hollered, Don't shoot! and throwed it down and heisted his hands. I seen he had my knife and pistol stuck in his belt, so I took them off of him and tossed the forty-fives I'd been using onto the billiard table and said, Give these back to the buffalo hunters. But just then he whipped out a thirty-eight he was wearing under his arm and shot at me and knocked my hat off. Then he turned and run around the end of the bar, all bent over to get his head below it. So I grabbed the bartender's shotgun and let Bam with both barrels just as his rear end was going out of sight. He shrieked blue ruin and started having a fit behind the bar. So I throwed the shotgun through the roulette wheel and stalked forth, leaving Ace and the bouncer and the marshal wailing and wallering on the floor. It was plumb disgustful the way they wept and cussed over their trifling injuries. I come out on the street so sudden that them cusses which was hiding behind the hoss trough to shoot me as I come out was took by surprise and only grazed me in a few places, so I throwed a few slugs amongst them and they took to their heels. I got on Captain Kidd and headed east down the street, ignoring the shots fired at me from the alleys and winders, that is, I ignored em except to shoot back at em as I run and I reckon that's how the mayor got the lobe of his ear shot off. I thought I heard somebody holler when I answered a shot fired at me from behind the mayor's board fence. Well, when I got to the clump of cottonwoods, there weren't no sign of Gloria, the hoss, or the buckboard. But there was a note stuck up on a tree which I grabbed and read by the light of the moon. It said, Dear Tejano, your friend must have been kidding you. I never even knew anybody named Biz Ridgeway. 
But I'm taking this chance of getting away from Ace. I'm heading for Trevano Springs, and I'll send the buckboard back from there. Thank you for everything. Gloria Levener. I got to Goshen about sunup, having loped all the way. Biz Ridgeway was at the bar of the Spanish Mustang, and when he seen me, he turned pale and dived for the winder, but I grabbed him. What you mean by telling me that lie about you and Gloria Lavenner? I demanded. Was you trying to get me killed? Well, says he, to tell you the truth, Breck, I was. All's fair in love and war, you know. I wanted to get you out of the way so I'd have a clear field with Betty Wilkinson, and I knowed about Ace Middleton and Gloria and figured he'd do the job if I sent you over there. But you needn't get mad. It didn't do me no good. Betty's already married. What? I yelled. He ducked instinctively. Yeah, he says. He took advantage of your absence to pop the question, and she accepted him and they're on their way to Kansas City for their honeymoon. He never had the nerve to ask her while you was in town, for fear you'd shoot him. They're going to live in the East because he's too scared of you to come back. Who? I screamed, foaming slightly at the mouth. Rudwell Shapley, Jr., says he. It's all your fault. It was at this moment that I dislocated Biz Ridgeway's hind leg. I likewise defies the criticism which has been directed at this perfectly natural action. An Elkins with a busted heart is no man to trifle with. End of Texas John Alden End of Bear Creek Collection Volume 2